ha hiszünk a magunk erejében, képesek vagyunk véget vetni a kommunista diktatúrának, ha elég eltökéltek vagyunk, rászoríthatjuk az uralkodó pártot, hogy alávesse magát a szabad választásoknak, ha nem tévesztjük szem elől 56 eszméit, olyan kormányt választhatunk magunknak, amely azonnali tárgyalásokat kezd az orosz csapatok kivonásának. June 16, 1989. A young oppositionist, Viktor Orbán, is speaking at the reburial ceremony of Imre Naj, leader of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 against the Soviet-backed government. The ceremony marks a crucial milestone in the collapse of communism in Hungary. During a short speech, Orbán demands the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Budapest and free elections. His charisma is undeniable, and he is just 26 years old. Orbán will take part in the roundtable talks, which will result in creating a constitutional democracy and the end of 40 years of communist rule in Hungary. So how did Viktor Orbán go from being a liberal politician to a conservative populist? This is the talented Viktor Orbán. Viktor Orbán was born on May 31, 1963. He spent most of his childhood in a village called Felcsut. Orbán grew up in poverty, and many of his biographers point out that his home didn't even have running water. Viktor spent most of his childhood working in the field with his two brothers. His character was certainly also influenced by the way he was brought up by his father. Jozo Orbán was a very stern man. And in his interviews, Viktor Orbán made no secret of the fact that he was beaten by his father, not only in his childhood, but also in his teenage years. But at the same time, he also describes himself as an incredibly naughty child who lacked discipline and whose character from early childhood was marked by a strong tendency to rebel. 14-year-old Orbán gets accepted into a prestigious middle school. This coincides with the social advancement of the Orbán family. They move to the city and Victor's father graduates from college and becomes a mechanic, while Victor's mother finishes a teacher's college and becomes involved in educating disabled children. The teenage Victor Orban spends most of his time on the football pitch. Although he does not show much footballing talent, it's a sport in which he thrives thanks to hard work and persistence, as in every aspect of life, as all his biographers emphasize. It should also be mentioned that Viktor Orbán played as a central forward in a team that at one point became the top youth football league in Hungary. In later years, Orbán initiated the construction of a football pitch in his home village of Felcsut, which was named in honor of the Hungarian footballer Ferenc Puskas. In fact, Orbán's lifelong dream of rebuilding Hungary's footballing power and restoring the glory of the Golden Eleven has been with him all his life. Although his dream did not come true, Viktor Orbán is still seen in football arenas today and is an avid football supporter. Viktor Orbán studies law in Budapest. His master's thesis is on the Polish Solidarity Movement. At university, Viktor Orbán gets into a very prestigious dormitory, where he comes into contact with young, ambitious students who form something like a brotherhood, a very closely cooperating organization. That's where he gets his first taste of political practice and leadership and develops certain qualities that will be visible in the following years of his career. If you look at Fides, which just grows out of the student movement, it was basically a radical youth organization at the beginning. The party was essentially based on Orbán's dorm mates. Most of them have held key positions in the state. When Orbán was prime minister, one of his colleagues was head of parliament, another was president, another wrote the new Hungarian constitution. So this kind of close circle around Orbán was actually formed at the end of the 1980s and is still crucial to the functioning of Fidesz today. This is also the fundament of Orbán's success, that he has been surrounded by loyal companions for many years. Of course, this does not mean that working together has gone well with all of them. At least a few of them came into quite sharp conflict with Orbán. Some, as the party evolved ideologically very significantly, left it altogether, such as Gabor Fodor, who became more liberal. The story of Lajos Simicka is particularly interesting. Orbán had actually known him since high school in Sekesvehervar, and they later studied together, although Lajos Simicka was a few years older. 
Historically, he was responsible for creating the entire media empire and economic base of Fides. However, during the party's peak influence in the years after the great victory in 2010, Lajos Simicka began to be too powerful. He began to have such enormous influence that Fides members wondered who had the last word, Viktor Orban or Lajos Simicka, despite the fact that he was basically a little-known public figure, but extremely influential in this very base of the party. Well, in 2014 to 2015 there was a divorce, and this was a very spectacular conflict because at one point Shimichka began to criticize Orban publicly and in quite vulgar terms. He started to direct his media against Orban. He also tried to support Yobbik, a rival party that was just trying to create an alternative to Fides. In the end he lost this game. After a few years he also lost the media he managed, while Orban was able to build a new media empire this time one completely loyal to him. If there were any disputes between Orban and his former companions, they were often temporarily sidelined, but it was rarely the case that there was a complete split between them. Viktor Orban was 21 when he was elected president of the student committee. This was in fact his first such political debut. Even then he had already distinguished himself as a very leader-like person in his environment in fact, setting the tone among the elite to which he had begun to belong. Politically active, young Fidesz members were supported by the George Soros Foundation. If we look at the long-standing conflict between Orban and the Jewish-Hungarian-American billionaire and philanthropist George Soros, it may be surprising to learn that in the 1980s it was Soros who was one of the sponsors of Fides. He was one of the people who very strongly supported Fides. In fact, Orban himself was a Soros Foundation recipient. He went to Oxford where he was supposed to study for a year. But when it became clear at the beginning of 1990 that Hungary would hold its first democratic elections after the fall of communism, Orbán's political temperament got the better of him. After only a few months in Oxford, he returned to Hungary and threw himself into politics. After a few years, a transition takes place, and Fidesz moves in a conservative direction. It is worth pointing out that in its first years, Fidesz was in fact a liberal party. It was a party of young activists from the student movement who were challenging the elites, not only the communist elite against whom it had initially rebelled, but also those transformational elites that came to power after 1989. Viktor Orban and his party colleagues did not wear ties in Parliament. They presented a completely different style. They were rebellious. They were opposed to the ruling elite that strongly appealed to national slogans, to religion, to the church and so on. Fidesz was more like an anti-clerical, rebellious party. There is a legend that has been circulating for many years in Budapest about Viktor Orban's supposed conversation with the dying Jozef Antal, the first Prime Minister of Democratic Hungary, who ruled for the first three years until 1993. He died gravely ill, still in his function as Prime Minister when he received Orban on his deathbed. The subject of their conversation was never disclosed publicly, but there is a legend that it was then that Antal allegedly passed the baton to Orban as the leader of this more conservative nationalist camp. Antal's family didn't fully confirm that this was in fact the case, but it strengthened Orban's turn toward the conservative direction, and under his leadership, Fides did in fact gradually move from these liberal, very libertarian positions of the first years of their existence towards a conservative side. However, it was gradual, and this rightward turn or evolution of Fidesz continues to this day. Orban won a parliamentary seat in the free elections of 1990, and in 1993 he became president of Fidesz. Apart for three years between 2000 and 2003, he has been its leader ever since. 
He became head of the government for the first time in 1998. His first term was at the head of the center-right government. It was very significant for Hungary at the time, as it coincided with its NATO accession, as well as intense efforts to join the European Union. This is a very good moment for Hungary, a period of economic prosperity after the instability and crisis of the 1990s. Yet even then you can see some of the characteristics of Viktor Orban and Fidesz which will become apparent in his later governments. Tendencies such as using certain state resources to support the party, the strong footing of the party message, and Orban's own message in national slogans, embedding their messaging in historical issues. We can see this in these early years, although still then, Orban is a pro-Western leader, who brings Hungary into NATO, who has good relations with the United States, with the Western partners. His relationship with Russia is cold, so from today's point of view, you can see that even then, Orban was at a different stage. In 2002, Fidesz loses power, quite unexpectedly, because it was not the worst period for Hungary, especially economically. And then there seems to be a significant transformation of Orban. At first, he cannot accept his defeat and gradually turns, in the 2000s, in a populist direction. It seems that it was then when he must have concluded that, in fact, in order to stay in power, you have to control the media, which will become apparent later on. It's when he tries to build the social and media foundations of Fidesz. For eight years, he is out of the government, a leader of Fidesz in opposition. In 2006, after his second electoral defeat, there is an attempt to remove him from power. A few Fidesz activists try to stage a coup, but it fails. There has been no attempt to remove Orban from power ever since. He remains the undisputed leader of the party. That same year, 2006, a few months after losing the elections, Fidesz gets a gift from God. Anti-government protests erupted after a tape was leaked on the Hungarian state radio of a private speech made by Prime Minister Ferenc Gyurcsány confessing that his Hungarian Socialist Party had lied to win the 26th election and had done nothing worth mentioning in the previous four years of governing. Of course, Fidesz and Viktor Orban are fueling this movement of dissent, but not immediately capitalizing on it. As the left is gradually losing popularity, the 2008 financial crisis hits Hungary extremely hard. And only in 2010 does Orban finally and triumphantly return to power, winning the election decisively and gaining, in principle, a majority enabling him to amend the constitution. Magyarországnak ma olyan emberre van szüksége, aki képes munkahelyeket teremteni. Olyan emberre, aki képes talpra állítani a gazdaságot. Olyan emberre, aki képes rendet tenni az egészségügyben. Olyan emberre, aki képes garantálni a közbiztonságot. A megfelelő ember a megfelelő időben. Itt az idő Magyarország. Készült a Fidesz-KDNP megbízásából. After winning a majority in parliament, the Fidesz government proposed a completely new constitution. It read that the Hungarian state did not exist during the Nazi and socialist periods, and that in the Hungarian state created at a later period, the nation is the most important element of its structure. And the word nation is viewed in a transporter context. Fidesz is very much focused on historical politics and is also trying to restore the proper weight to the significance of the Treaty of Trianon for Hungarians. The 1920 peace treaty sealed Hungary's loss of two-thirds of its territory and is perceived as the country's greatest national tragedy, breaking up the multinational kingdom of Hungary, as a result of which large Hungarian-speaking populations found themselves in neighboring countries, was a pivotal event which influenced Hungary's national identity. After 2010, Fidesz is concerned with the takeover of institutions. The process itself can be called a gradual oligarchization. Most of the state companies are staffed by people close to Viktor Orban. Corruption is also progressing. The current level of corruption in Hungary, according to EU indicators, is one of the highest and is second only to Bulgaria. This is also a period of capturing the media. The new state we are building is an illiberal state. Viktor Orban in 2014. As far as the media is concerned, over the last decade or so, there have been a number of media takeovers by Fidesz or oligarchs linked to the party, or the closure of media outlets critical of Orban. 
But even when it comes to educational or cultural institutions, there is an approach that, in fact, the party should have the dominant role in the state, which is, of course, paradoxical if we consider that the origin story of Orban and Fidesz was resisting the Communist Party. There is a certain dance in global diplomacy, a peacock dance. Viktor Orban in 2012. A very important slogan of Hungary's foreign policy is the opening to the East. This is a strategy that has been consciously and actively shaped by Viktor Orban since 2011. The slogan is related to his personal conviction that we have reached the civilizational end of the West, and therefore economic relations with the Far East should be strengthened, primarily with China, although this opening to the East Kalatinitas in Hungarian also includes Russia or Turkey. Back in 2008, when the socialist government was entering into various forms of cooperation with Russia, like in the area of gas imports, then Orban was saying that the left-wing government wanted Hungary to become Gazprom's happiest barrack, which was a reference to earlier slogans. But suddenly there is a big change. Just before coming to power at the end of 2009, still as leader of the largest opposition party, Orban met with Vladimir Putin. After his great electoral victory, there is a dramatic change. Suddenly his government begins to extensively cooperate with Russia. It's not only gas cooperation, but also nuclear cooperation, the construction of a nuclear power plant. There is also very close political cooperation. Here we see that Orban, who had been increasingly coming into conflict with his Western partners, was growing ever closer to the leaders of Russia and China. I think there was also a kind of psychological transformation, because in fact Orban had been kept at arm's length in the West for many years after his electoral victory. Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, received him with open arms, year after year, and they have been meeting for many years now. And in fact, Orban began saying this. He has this famous speech in Kazakhstan where he says he feels better here than in Brussels. Simply put, at some point, he began to feel more at home in relations with authoritarian leaders than in European democracies. So in other words, at some point, he started to get better at dealing with authoritarian leaders. What we are doing now is exactly the same, not on economics, but on the fundamental of not applying the rules closing our eyes of what is happening. And no, Mr. Orban, it's not against Hungary. You have not the right to say that, that these people here are fighting against the Hungarian interest. It's the opposite, it's true. It's not your interest, but your interest is not the Hungarian interest. What we are defending here is Hungarian democracy and the interest of the Hungarian citizens. Another area where Orban's turnaround can be seen is in his worldview. Orban comes from a non-religious family and for many years he did not belong to any religious community. His conversion takes place somewhere in the 1990s and 2000s. To some extent this was influenced by his wife who is a Catholic and most of his five children are brought up in this faith. He was also influenced by the Calvinist pastor Zoltan Balog who incidentally would become a minister in his government in the future. Of course, it's difficult to say to what extent this change is the result of some personal transformation or reflection, and to what extent it's opportunistic with this turn to the right in a conservative direction. Orban presenting himself as a non-believer would also be very unreliable for the conservative traditional electorate. Over the years, Fidesz has also become a more conservative party in terms of its worldview. This is expressed, for example, by enshrining in the constitution the issues of protecting life from the moment of conception, or describing marriage as a union between a man and a woman. But at the same time, civil partnerships, including same-sex couples, have been legal in Hungary since 2009, introduced by Orbán's predecessors. And changing this law would be very unpopular. Hungary also has a liberal abortion law, 
and Orbán has not changed it during his 13 years in power. So we see that Orbán clearly calculates what is popular, what is unpopular, and adapts to it. Of course, there is a certain ideological narrative of Fidesz aimed at the most hardline electorate. Orbán and his team for sure look at the polls and try to adapt their decisions to fit public expectations. Orbán is also known for his eccentric political style and for incorporating different registers into his speeches. He mixes high and low style, sometimes with all seriousness describing the historical threats to Hungary, only to break the pathos with a joke. This does not work well in every situation. One case was where Orbán famously lost the 2006 election debate with his arch-rival Ferenc Gyurcsán. It seems that over the last decade or so, the message and Orbán's image have been very consciously built. Orbán performs well in front of tens of thousands of supporters. His social media messaging is very efficient. But, interestingly, he almost never gives interviews to media organizations that are unfavorable to him. It's difficult to find a politician in Central and Eastern Europe who is more charismatic than Viktor Orbán. He manifests this primarily in his public appearances, and he has many opportunities to do so, thanks to his position in the Hungarian media. To give an example, he has a regular Friday appearance on the Hungarian Radio Kossuth, where for nearly an hour he talks about his visions and ideas. Orbán's speeches have a certain style, which could even be compared to a stand-up because of his sense of humor. He can be very ironic or sarcastic. In fact, this sarcasm is his character trait, emphasized by many biographers. Another way to describe his style would be to call it, well, quaint. His staff make great use of social media, where they publish a variety of footage. Not just official speeches, but also footage of events, such as the Orbans cooking together as a family, or an event that is part of Hungarian folklore, such as the pig slaughter. Viktor Orbán certainly knows how to please his voters, and reading the comments under his publications, we get the impression that they're doing a really great job. In 2015, Hungary found itself in the middle of a migrant crisis that was escalating in Europe. In a sense, it fell into Orbán's lap, as Fidesz was losing support at the time. Orbán is also a politician who seems to have a very good public ear, and on many issues he was able to grasp the public demand for certain things. Especially in this era of change in Hungary, like the regime change after 1989, the economic change, where there was a lot of instability and people lost their sense of security. Orbán has very much set his sights on the kind of historical and identity issues that, in this chaotic time, could settle people into a sense of where they come from and where they are going. He refers to the past and also weaves a far-reaching vision for the future. He makes people feel that they are not alone, not doomed to live in some kind of instability. Even if these visions are highly debatable, this seems to be one of the secrets of Orbán's success. The hegemony of the West has come to an end. A new world order is emerging. Viktor Orbán in 2024. At home he began to portray migrants as the greatest civilizational threat. And in Europe he tried to break his isolation by showing that he is the leader who knows the recipe for the future, who knows how to protect Europe from the influx of migrants. Thanks to this, he actually managed to regain his popularity both at home and in Europe, and to become a point of reference, albeit a rather radical one, in international discussions. Viktor Orbán and his policies have become especially popular in the sphere of American right-wing politics. He has been praised and embraced by the likes of TV personality Tucker Carlson and former President Donald Trump, and has been invited to major conservative gatherings, such as the CPAC, which even took place in Hungary. The changes Orbán implemented throughout the years in Hungary are viewed as a blueprint for U.S. conservatives. They hate me and slander me and my country as they hate you and slander you and America you stand for. We all know how this works. And there is no doubt that Viktor Orbán is a leader who absolutely dominates modern Hungarian politics. In the last 30 years, in fact, he has been an absolutely dominant figure. 
And perhaps this is part of a certain demand that there is in Hungary. If you look at the last 170 years of Hungarian history, it's a period of very long reigns of many leaders. From Franz Joseph back in the Austro-Hungarian period, through Miklos Horthy in the interwar period, and then Janos Kador. They all ruled for several decades. Orban is reaching his 18th year in power, and his appetite to rule Hungary does not seem to be waning. He is already openly saying that he is thinking about governing until at least 2030, in fact, probably even longer. So it's not impossible that he will eventually find himself in the lineage of these long-standing leaders of Hungary, even if their assessment today is often generally quite negative. It remains to be seen how history will judge Viktor Orban, who raised huge hopes in Hungary, but his rule today seems to be encountering more and more problems in terms of direction, in foreign policy, in terms of economic challenges. This might be the most difficult moment of his career and his historical assessment may be somewhat different from how he is judged today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more stories like this one.